Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Men's and Chronic Pain Overcoming Stigma Finding Solutions Facebook Live event. I'm Teresa Din, the Senior Executive Director at the Arthritis Foundation. Tonight's event is the third in three-part series of challenges of living with chronic pain and solutions to physical, mental, and emotional effects. It's part of the Arthritis Foundation's ongoing commitment to improving the quality of life for those living with chronic pain. As part of our three-year agenda, we bolstered our response to tackling chronic pain by launching our newest resource, VIM. VIM is a mobile app where you can set realistic goals, achieve small wins, and have big victories against chronic pain. It's a way to get information, resources, and connect with the community. It'll allow you to unlock your chronic strength and take back what pain has stolen from you. It's Arthritis Foundation at your fingertips. To help you understand it a little bit more, I'd like to share with you this short video. Vim is defined as energy and enthusiasm, but to us, Vim means so much more. Vim is a confidant, a friend, and an ally. It's a partner who sticks with you no matter how rough the seas. It's a master motivator who inspires you to achieve the little wins that add up to big victories. And it's a state of mind. Vim gives us the strength to set and achieve our goals. It gets us out of bed on a bad day and helps us sleep more soundly. Vim is a constant companion, a best friend, and a good listener. And Vim is always there when we need it. Welcome the newest weapon in the battle with chronic pain. Say hello to Vim. Now, wasn't that exciting? If you haven't downloaded the Vim app, you can get it on Google Play or the Apple Store. Together, we can fight against chronic pain. So let's begin the discussion tonight. tonight tonight's event will be moderated by Dr. Alan Byer. I'm actually here in Dr. Alan Byer's office in Huntington Beach, California. Dr. Alan Byer is an orthopedic surgeon in Orange County who has practiced for over 20 years, 40 years. He attended Georgetown Medical School and completed his orthopedic surgery residence at the <laughs> Hospital for Joint and Disease in New York City. And he went to Sports Medicine Fellowship at Curlin and Joe Clinic in Los Angeles. He has a private practice here in Orange County he also is the team physician for University High School for almost 30 years. He co-founded Hogue Orthopedic Institute in Irvine, California. He is the doctor in the dugout for the show on Angels Baseball AM 830. He is passionate about raising awareness for those who have arthritis. He also has psoriatic arthritis with himself. Dr. Byer, welcome and thank you for leading this discussion. Dr. Byer, you can take my seat. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you for trying to make me 20 years younger as well. I always appreciate that. Welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to host tonight's event, which features panelists representing physicians and patients from various medical backgrounds and diagnoses. Together, their unique perspectives will facilitate a discussion about overcoming the stigma that men must tough out pain as it relates to various aspects of daily life, including fatherhood, relationships, medical care, work life, and so much more. Our panel includes Dr. Jean Bonhomme, as he's an assistant professor of medicine in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Morehouse School of Medicine. He co-founded the National Black Men's Health Network, a community-based nonprofit organization providing preventative health education in minority communities since 1988. Dr. Bonhomme is a national expert on men's health serving as a member of the Board of Advisors for the Men's Health Network and on the editorial boards of the Journal of Men's Health and Gender and the American Journal of Men's Health. Dr. Ramon Jimenez, a veteran orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Jimenez has achieved leadership roles in national, mm -hmm. regional, and local healthcare provider organizations. Over the past 40 years, he has served the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons at many levels, including the Board of Directors, and is the recipient of AAOS Diversity and Leadership Award. He's the founder and first president of the American Association of Latino Orthopedic Surgeons and a past president of the California Orthopedic Association. Armin Brott is a pioneer in the field of fatherhood 
and has been building better fathers for more than a decade. As the author of eight best-selling books on fatherhood, he's helped millions of men around the world become the fathers they want to be and that their children need them to be. Pete Scalia, around the age of 30, Pete was diagnosed with severe rheumatoid arthritis. The decision to discontinue his medication for a while to start a family proved life-changing for Pete, resulting in bilateral hip and knee replacement surgeries and many other physical changes. A true RA warrior, Pete considers it an obligation to educate people about arthritis. He's actively involved with the Arthritis Foundation and encourages those living with chronic pain to never give up. Throughout our discussion, we want to hear from those of you who are watching. Mm -hmm. So add your mm -hmm. comments and questions in the thread and we'll address them during the discussion. Thank you again to all of our panelists ahead of time for participating. Our first conversation topic is about navigating the pain experience. So let's talk about the fact that men seem to be far less likely to report chronic pain symptoms and more likely to face stigma from society and be influenced by their own perceived beliefs about pain. How does that affect their care? Ramon, let's start with you, a fellow orthopedic surgeon. What do you think about this? Yeah, I think it's true. I do believe that men self-characterize themselves and, and believe they're supposed to be, quote, men, and therefore not complain. Uh, also, when they're involved with their uh, providing for the family, if you would, if they happen to be uh, have a family, uh, they tend to put off their, their uh, symptoms and put off getting a diagnosis, put off going to see a doctor. And, and part of it is that uh, aspect that we all sometimes suffer for, and that is denial. And if, if maybe you deny it, it won't happen to you, or all of a sudden you get back to normal and you can go on from there. So I'll add to that also the whole no pain, no gain thing. Guys just seem to be brought up with that. And we'll, we'll get into that a little bit with fatherhood and stuff in a minute or two. But, but John, I'd like to ask your input on something too. We hear a lot in today's times, especially, that men of color are not as believed by the medical system as people who are not of color. And how do you think that affects this whole aspect of complaints about pain, maybe not being recipients of the same level of care or attention to care as other segments of the population? How does this affect those populations specifically? Well, you have to start with the foundation that young boys are told when, it's, when they're eight years old and they skin their knee, they're told brave boys don't cry. When they get hurt, hurt playing football, they get told take one for the team. So they're 50 and having chest pain, they say that's just indigestion. You know, boys are raised with the expectation that if they just leave things alone, just with time, things will get better. Uh, that's not nearly as true in middle age as to how it affects minority men in particular. We have to consider uh, if you look at the, a reference break in health issues in the black community, there was a time when they referred to dangerous jobs as Negro work. And I personally have known people having done some work in addiction medicine who are massively injured because of their uh, occupations. One man was told to lift something that was impossible to lift and he collapsed two vertebrae. Uh, two men who worked in, uh, in mining uh, were talking about how the whole right side of their body, their lifting side was hurting. And one, one man said, when you've done manual labor all your life, you don't have much left. And so, you know, minority races are disproportionately represented in, in manual labor jobs that are physically injurious. Ramon, I see you have something you want to chip in here as well. Right. Just as background, I don't know if our audience uh, realizes the fact. I know when I relay this to friends, uh, they're astonished and that there are well-proven studies in the emergency room that uh, patients of color, African-Americans, uh, Latinx patients, they receive about 50% of the dose of pain medications for long bone fractures. Uh, and they are checked half, half of the time or they go for longer periods before they are checked by the nurses for pain, and those are documented studies that are busy 
uh, emergency rooms. Let me shift to a little bit of a different um, area, and, and I'm going to ask for some input here from Pete, because Lord knows you had plenty of pain with your bilateral hip knee disease requiring joint replacement and, and an underlying disease of rheumatoid arthritis. Mm -hmm. Men are, are purported to have a greater tolerance for pain. Is this, first of all, is it true? Second of all, is this a good or a bad thing? Um, I mean, I would definitely say it's true. I know it is. Obviously, I can only speak for myself, but, um, you know, I have, I have buddies the same way. And you uh, you think you can take pretty much anything. And, um, you know, but between the symptoms of RA and the damage that's already been done to my body, you know, you're, you're pretty much in pain every day anyway. Um, so if you actually say you're in pain, then you know, you, you know that you're actually really dealing with some, some pretty severe pain. Um, but I know that when it comes to, you know, I, with three small kids, uh, as a result of like everything we went through to conceive and stuff, um, you know, I, I think there's also that aspect that you don't, you don't want your kids more than even peers or anyone else to perceive you as having any kind of weakness, right? Like as a parent, it's almost like, you're you're kind of viewed as like a superhero and, and can't do any wrong um so i think when it comes to like the the tolerance of pain i think maybe over time you learn to live with it more than accept it um but i think like a lot of people that live with arthritis and maybe the damage associated with it um you're always looking for whatever will will get you through today to uh, to help you out but i i would say it probably has significantly impacted um what maybe when i was younger i thought something might hurt a little bit it really gives you a perspective as to what real chronic pain really is we're going to come back to that when we talk a little bit about outcomes in a couple of minutes but armin i want to ask you something as a father and somebody who's teaching other people how to be a father how does a father of sons communicate to their sons what an appropriate response to pain is? You know, kids have a way of sometimes magnifying when something hurts, when they want some secondary gain. But by the same token, you don't want to ignore their pain complaints because all that does is breed that, you know, I'm a strong man, nothing hurts me attitude. So come, come at this for us from a, the, the standpoint of fatherhood. We need to define what that means exactly, because it, whether you can tolerate a lot of pain or whether you ignore it, they're, they're different things. I mean, I think all you need to do is, is watch a woman in labor, and you'll agree that women have got a pretty significant uh, amount of pain tolerance. And my mother is is incredible. She you know, doesn't. She she just has all sorts of pain constantly. But with uh, with fatherhood, I think it really starts whether it's boys or girls. With exactly with with uh, what Dr. Bonham mentioned is this big boys don't cry thing and the play through it or take one for the team or you, you turn on sports center or any kind of uh, sports show and we see how guys are playing with broken bones or torn ligaments or all these things and somehow they're made out to be heroes for that not that it's it's bad you want to stay be there for your team but there has to be a line where where it's it's uh, seen as you need to rest you need to relax and there was just a thing just the other day uh, I think it might have been yesterday or today, LeBron James was saying there's so many injuries in the NBA now because they cut the the, uh, the off-season between the playoffs and the beginning of the next season down, so the players aren't getting a chance to rest. And this is, this is exactly what we need to be fighting against as fathers, as parents in general. Mothers can do this too. But if you're hurt, stop what you're doing. And if you, if you need help, it's okay to ask. And I, I can also talk about this, we can get into it later, but something from, from the perspective of, of military service members or first responders or people like that who, who also have to definitely ignore their pain. One of my, I was in the Marine Corps, and one of my favorite shirts, which I drag out every once in a while, I couldn't find it, is uh, the, one of the famous slogans we heard in boot camp of pain is just weakness leaving your body. And we, we, need, to, we need to get past that. Uh, and we need to get to a point where it's it's okay, and and it's it's something that's being discussed openly now in the military community, where 
there they are saying they are showing particularly mental health issues but physical health issues as well that asking for help is a sign of strength it's not a sign of weakness john i know you had something you wanted to add here dr bonham yeah i wanted to add to the point about how people are treated when they do seek help my brother died from sickle cell anemia, and I had an experience where I was, he was in Virginia, I was in Georgia, but at one point I was in Virginia, he was having a sickle cell crisis, and he asked for Dilaudid, and the doctor under-medicated him because the presumption was that he was an addict. So the point is that the response to pain is different for minorities, you know, uh, because there's so much stereotyping. It's part of the reason, and I think that that needs to be brought out under treatment of pain. I think we have a kind of a balancing act to do here, though, too, because in the middle of an opioid crisis that we experience in the United States now, where um, medical norms said that the pain becomes the fifth vital sign, so we're going to medicate you to the point where you have zero pain, I think that was an overreaction. I think we overused in some settings, I'm not saying that this is across the board, but I think in some settings we overused opioids to completely minimize pain and made people a little bit too dependent and, and thinking the idea that they were going to have zero pain. And that's partly responsible for what we find ourselves in today with overprescription of opioids. Ramon, I know you've got something you want to add here too. So I, uh, I'm bilingual and I speak Spanish fluently and I uh, practice in San Jose, Monterey, uh, California. Uh, in Monterey County, even though it includes Pebble Beach and Carmel, is 64% Hispanic. And my point is that I have to explain to patients exactly what pain medicine is supposed to do. I have to explain to them, that, because the Latino patient sometimes will say, the, the medicine isn't working. It does not take away my pain. And so there is a difference between taking away your pain or lessening your pain so that you can continue on, on doing your activities of daily living. And so when I, st when I really pinpoint them and say, are you, does the pain, I don't ask them, does the pain work? Because they say no, because their answer is the end point, taking all my pain away. And if I ask them, can they function better when they take the medicine, they say yes. And so they do understand it, but it's important to be able to explain these nuances to uh, patients of different ethnicities or cultures. I think the key is we have to learn to ask the right questions, not ask, mm -hmm. is your pain zero? We've got a question from one of our viewers here that I'm gonna share with everybody and anybody jump in who wants to tackle it. I'm a big guy, so people automatically assume I can tough out pain. How do I get people to start taking me seriously when I tell them I'm not feeling well and need to sit some things out? Who wants to comment on that? Go ahead, Ramon. Well, you know, I take a big guy, and to me, a big guy is somebody who's about six foot tall, weighs uh, 240 pounds or something like that. And so I immediately point out to them that you have every reason to have some pain. Uh, and if it's in your knees, it's well known that five times your body weight goes through that knee joint every step you take. And so, therefore, you do have reason to have pain. And you can be proud of the fact that, that you do have pain and, and uh, voice it. Make sure you articulate it and you make that voice. Don't over-exaggerate it but voice the fact that you have pain and don't be afraid of, of doing that. Armin? Yeah, I think that, that that's exactly where I was going to go. Is it, It's so critical. and It's not exactly an answer to the question, but it's important for this big guy and other big guys to step up and say something about this. I mean, I, I can tell you from my own experience, I did for many years full contact fighting and karate and Krav Maga and all sorts of things and, and taught myself over time to have a high pain tolerance and to ignore things. And I ignored them so much to the point that I didn't go to the doctor at all until I could barely move my arms. Uh, and I was having pain and numbness and, and 
things that turned out to be very serious. I had to have surgery and had a, a laminectomy infusion of uh, four, five, six, seven. So you know, a pretty, pretty serious life-saving surgery, largely because, well, I was having fun, but largely because I ignored it. And at times, you know, I'd have an injury and I'd go back in. I'd have another injury and I'd go back in. And it was because of exactly what the gentleman uh, whose questions you, you read just a second ago was, I didn't want people to think. I'm, I'm six feet tall. I weigh 190 pounds. I'm not huge. But uh, I didn't want people to think that I couldn't take it or that I was a wimp or whatever. And so it's important for people to stand up or, in his case, to sit down and to say, I need a break here. Right, let's move on to a little, a little different topic here in terms of disease management and managing outcomes. Um, a deep dive into the arthritic conditions that affect men, osteoarthritis, the various inflammatory arthritis, um, even fibromyalgia, which is a diagnosis that men are diagnosed with now, they, they traditionally weren't before. Uh, are, are, why is an accurate diagnosis so important to accelerate treatment and optimize outcomes and quality of life? Pete, why don't you tackle this one first? I mean, I know that when I was first experiencing pain that just seemed abnormal to me and had no idea what was causing it, um, it seemed like a lot of the medical professionals I went to, and it wasn't all that long ago, were looking for some sort of cause um, other than, and I, and I get that, you know, process of elimination, you know, could it be gout? Could it be like all these other things that were causing different, you know, pain in different parts of the body. Um, but that was kind of like uh, frustrating was getting to that diagnosis. Um, in a way, it was kind of a relief because uh, the only other person in my family I knew that had rheumatoid arthritis was uh, one of my grandmother's sisters. And of course, being diagnosed in the 1940s, she faced a much different outcome than most people do today. Um, but I think a lot of those doctors, and I know we'll talk about it later, um, you know, I, I actually had one physician when I was trying to figure out the cause of the pain that I was having um, said, well, gee, aren't you a little young and male to have arthritis? And I thought that was kind of surprising, especially even now we still deal with that stigma in particular. Thank goodness for HLA B27 test. That gave a lot of guys their sanity back. Um, Jean, let me ask you, because this really hones in on, on your specialty. Men aren't very good or are less likely to use their coping skills um, to deal with their chronic pain. How does this impact disease activity? And, and what are some coping mechanisms that we need to, to educate men about in terms of dealing with their diagnoses? Well, for, well, first of all, you know, men are coping with pain by sleeping. And period time is essential to being able to figure out, you know, what type of treatment is needed. You know, whether whether if it's osteoarthritis in a weight-bearing joint, weight loss would help, or if it's rheumatoid arthritis, which may have other complications like Sjogren's syndrome. You know, the point is that knowing what it is, is the most important thing. I think that the approach that I generally try to take in regard to getting men to get a healthier coping ability is to paint the, the doctor and help him as an ally of the masculinity. They feel that masculinity just being older, something of that nature, to make help that, that the proper health care can help them maximize their manhood. You know, you have better health, you're a better man, you can provide better, you're more attractive, you have more endurance, you have more strength, you have attractiveness, that by making health care an ally, saying basically, you know, you take care of yourself, you can do better. You can, you, men are performance oriented. Men are not that fear oriented you know about this will happen to you that'll happen to you they don't they don't they don't think as much in those terms they're taught to deny fear as a matter of fact but the point is if you tell them this will help you be a better person and this will help you uh be what you can be with your children you know you can you'll you'll be see your grandchildren grow up in other forms then i think it becomes more appealing to men so you're going to be able to do better with your family with your job with your recreation with everything if your own personal health is better taken care of. Yes. Okay, so let's talk a little bit now about 
communication, because a lot of what we set up until now has been about men's traditional inability to communicate what they're feeling um, with their appropriate caregivers or, or whomever else they're making their medical decisions with. Um, how do we teach men, not just men, people, but especially men, since that's the, the, the subject of today's podcast, how do we teach men to effectively share decision-making and communicate with their, their doctors and their caregivers? Um, why don't we start with you on this one, Armin? And, and I'm, I know that Dr. Bonomo will agree with me on this. I would imagine Ramon will too, that we've got to get it to a point where men will actually go to the doctor, that men don't go for annual physicals. We're, we're about half as likely to, to have seen a doctor within the last five years as women are. And that's even after you take out all the OB related things. So getting guys to understand, to, to piggyback a little bit on what, uh, what Dr. Bonham was saying, it's not just a question of saying it'll, it'll help you be a, a better father or a better worker. It'll also keep you alive for your family and your kids. And, and I see Pete's nodding. I mean, that's what it's all about for, for those of us who have kids. I mean, is you want to be there. And you can't be there if you're not going to take care of yourself. And I know we're talking about pain, but we, we all should know that, that heart disease is the biggest risk and cancers and, and respiratory diseases. So making sure that you have an annual physical, that you go, that you have a relationship with your, with your provider. So you've got baseline PSA scores or baseline heart pr uh, blood pressure so that you know where you are so that the doctor can help you because most of us are not doctors. And so we're not gonna be able to, to monitor ourselves alone. So having that, that relationship with the provider doesn't have to be a doctor. We could use the word doctor all the time, but my primary care person happens to be a nurse practitioner and is fantastic. Um, but having that relationship with somebody on an ongoing basis, somebody that can help you can say, hey, you know what? Last time your your blood pressure was this, now it's a little high. Let's ch let's check uh, check that out a little bit. Or or your cholesterol is moving around. We should do something about that. Whatever it is, have it's that's the that's the key to the whole thing, and where all the communication is going to start. So let me you ask you, Pete, when, when you were diagnosed with your RA, mm -hmm. you know, many physicians still today are um, reluctant to diagnose a man with a chronic illness like mm -hmm. RA or, or, or fibromyalgia, which were called women's illnesses. Mm -hmm. um, how much trouble did you have finding a physician that you could communicate with and how receptive was he or she to listening to what you had to say and, and coming up with the right diagnosis. Because clearly in you, in a disease that we as orthopedic surgeons could fix a lot of your bad joints and improve your quality of life, mm -hmm. how many roadblocks did you run up against? Um, I know initially it took a few months to figure out and, and isolate you know the, the source of like what was causing this pain. Um, and as I mentioned, there were a few people I tried going to, uh, you know, different therapists, different doctors, trying to pinpoint what could be causing this. Um, and it was kind of frustrating. Like I said, though, it was almost a relief once I got that diagnosis, because then, you know, you have those conversations, like you're saying with your doctor on how can we best treat this? Like once you know for sure what you're dealing with. Um, I just wonder, though, too, I know some of the stuff that uh, Armin had mentioned there had me thinking of um, with the comorbidities uh, that are associated, the other things that people might have as a result of being RA, maybe guys would be more reluctant to say, oh, that's just because of my, you know, I, back in the day, I could remember, you know, my dad's friend saying, oh, it's my sciatica or it's my, you know, it's just something that they would just kind of like write off. But I think that once you develop that relationship with your, your caregiver, um, you know, it was really helpful for me. Um, you know, of course, it was a whole other process than finding the right thing that worked for me to treat it. But you have to have those conversations and not be afraid to, to talk about what you're experiencing with your body and things. And that's the way that at least I got the best care. So let me ask a question, and I'm going to direct this one a little bit more to Jean and Ramon. Um, you know, as physicians, many of us are not happy with all the direct-to-consumer advertising we see on television for various medications for psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, a multitude of other illnesses. But don't you think that a benefit of those ads might be that they're almost educational for a segment of the population that might not 
know about those diseases, save for those advertisements that they see on TV. Um, I mean, what are your thoughts about that? Go ahead, Ramon. Uh, well, first of all, uh, as I understand it, uh, as of a few years back, uh, the only two nations in the world that allowed direct to uh, consumer advertising was New Zealand and the United States. And I, uh, I think it can be informative to answer your question, but uh, I do really uh, believe that the most patients latch onto it as a panacea, and it really is not a, a panacea. Second of all, I'd like to make the point that that I uh, belong to a faculty in which we teach orthopedic surgeons and other clinicians uh, clinician-patient communication skills. And they're based on four things. That's one, empathy uh, with the patient. If you express empathy with the patient, engage the patient. In other words, uh, I walk into the room and I, and I see that he's got a, a welder's hat on. And I start talking about that, you know, about the welder's hat or they have uh, kids in the room. I introduce myself to the kids almost first uh, and talk to them and stuff. And, and if you show as a caregiver that you are definitely interested in them as a human, as a person, then they will open up uh, to you. Then you need to listen and you need to ask open-ended questions, not binary questions, but open-ended questions. And, and after that, then, then, you, ed then you educate them uh, and, uh, you, about their what you think their problem is and, and you may give them education uh, information, which I, which I do uh, to each one of them. And I give them homework. I said, this is your homework. And then you can, uh, when you come back, I want you to tell me what you learned or what you did. And um, so, and then at the end, you enlist them in this shared decision that you and I agree, you the patient and I agree that you're gonna try this medication, you're gonna try this, we're gonna put off having surgery, mm -hmm. whatever the outcome is, is going to be. And I think it works. I, as a parting opinion, I did want to say that I do, I have osteoarthrosis. I've had three knee, three total knees, two primary and one that has been a revision. And I do feel that osteoarthritis is really more mechanical and does not carry with it the same pain as inflammatory arthritis, even R RA, gouty arthritis, uh, uh, that can come in, those I think are really painful because they have the added component of the synovium putting out toxins, et cetera, uh, to contribute to the pain. Thank John, you. I see that you have something you'd like to add. Yeah, I'm not sure how educational they are because the ads are aimed at people who already know they have a specific diagnosis. So I'm not sure what they teach the person about the disease. My concern about them is that they advertise medications and then they say, then we also have advertisements saying that if you took this medication and your baby was born to form, you know, call the law firm of such and such and such and such and such and such. And, such. and I think that some people, I, I meet people who are terrified of conventional medicine. You know, they basically think, oh, the, like, 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 like the people who refuse the mm -hmm. vaccine. They're create the these ads are creating an atmosphere where people uh, don't trust the healthcare system because it's legally necessary for the advertisers and medications to warn it can cause this, it can cause this, it can cause this, it can cause this, and then when they see a, a lawyer ad, then it's it's a, it's a self fulfilling prophecy. So. Um, and also, you're, you're taking the medical decision away from the physician, you know. You can have patients coming in demanding a certain medication, and you as a physician may know that it's not suitable for that patient, and, uh, but, the, but the, you, it's very difficult to explain it to the patient who uh, does not have a medical education why they're advertising this thing, but it won't work for them. So while we're on this topic of communication and doctor-patient relationship, I want to 
kind of go back to a point that Ramon brought up, and I'd love to have some input on this from both Armin and Pete. Um, and both of you, Ramon and Jean, have both mentioned mm -hmm. shared decision making, and I'm a, a firm believer in shared decision making. But the, the shared decision isn't just with the doctor and the patient. It has to be with their family. Uh, and in the case of men, their spouse, no matter what the, the gender is of their significant other, um, First of all, 80% of medical decisions are usually made by the matriarch of a traditional family. So a large amount of medical decision making is made by women. Uh, and I think that we're going to get to men better by also talking to their spouses at the same time and let it be a shared decision making between everyone. Um, Armin, what do, what's your thoughts on that? I agree completely. I think these decisions really need to be made with as many of the, the stakeholders as possible. Uh, I, I've done a lot of writing about prostate cancer, and I know that, that there are a lot, I talked to a lot of guys who said, I was so happy that my wife or my sister was with me because the moment I heard the words prostate cancer from the doctor, I stopped listening. But my wife, fortunately, was taking notes. And I, I, I haven't had a diagnosis of, of, uh, of arthritis that's debilitating. I had stenosis and all sorts of, of other disappearing spinal cords and things. But the moment I started hearing those things, I mean, when, when somebody says, if you fall down and bump your head, you're going to be in a wheelchair for the rest of your life. I didn't hear anything else after that. And it took a couple of a couple of other visits. And I started going in with my mom and my dad uh, and some uh, some girlfriends I took in uh, also to, to go along with the, to, to get diagnosed. I think it's absolutely critical. And if you have adult children, that the adult children should be there, too, because I think one of the things that keeps us to get back to one of the topics in the beginning that keeps us from getting the care that we need is we don't want to be a burden on anybody else. We've got this provider protector thing going on. And so we're concerned about, well, if we go in, we have surgery, uh, it, somebody else is going to have to take care of me. And if we can have that other person there who can say, I'm willing to do that, or what kind of occupational therapy can you get? Or what kind of physical therapy can you get? I think those conversations are absolutely critical. So this is going to sound almost scripted, but I just got a question in our live chat box and I'll read it to you. And I think I'm going to ask Jean to comment on this question first. This past year has been really difficult and I've tried to be the rock my family needs me to be, but I don't always feel my best. I'm afraid if I cry or show vulnerability to my wife, she will feel less supported. How can I tell her about my problems while also letting her know I'm still her rock? John, you take this one away. Well, it's very difficult to, to uh, address that without knowing the specific personalities. I mean, is that just his perception that uh, that the wife would not be understanding? But the basic issue, uh, I would say that if that is the case, that he's dealing with people that are not understanding, that he can just basically assure them that no matter what, he's there for them and basically try to attribute as much as possible whatever problems he's having to external, you know, like uh, not able to go play and call it or something of that nature. He can contribute as much as possible to the phone so he does not weak one. That might be one, one of the ways that, that that could be approached. But I would really, if I was in his situation, I would really, you know, test the water. But I think the first thing to do is to reassure the family that no matter what is going on, you know, I'm going to be there for you and I'm going to do my best for you. And I think that that will take care of some of the judgmental uh, aspects that he might be facing. But that's not just his family. That's society wide. You know, I had a, a guy who used to work on my guitars and he developed severe headaches and he went to the doctor and the doctor kept giving him pain pills. He said, this is getting worse. And uh, the doctor, can you give me a brain scan? The doctor said, you need that. And he finally insisted. Turned out he had astrocytoma grade three and he lived about four years with it. But he had a serious problem and his doctor would not take him seriously. So this business about having to be the rock, it's not just the women, it's, it's the whole society. You know, sometimes when, uh, when the patient is not stoic, we as healthcare providers might make a mistake of being stoic for them. Okay, let's move into our next topic of discussion today, which is going to be emotional well-being, intimacy and relationships. It kind of relates to the question that we just got from our, our watcher. Um, chronic pain is very unpredictable, sometimes overwhelming, can feel humiliating. How have the various members of our panel 
been affected either personally or from experiences that they've had with others by this chronic pain and how it affects one's life and can just overtake one's life. I think, Pete, you're a good one to start mm -hmm. on this one. Um, I mean, there's no question that, you know, it, it can be something that's overbearing and uh, something that you, you wish would just go away. And, um, you know, it gets in the way of, of a lot of things. Sometimes, you know, it makes it difficult to communicate. Um, you know, I know personally, sometimes you might experience feelings of guilt because of the fact that, you know, if you're, you're married, your partner, um, you know, they have needs too. And if you are someone who is dealing with chronic pain and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's getting to that point of like accepting, like, you know, you, you don't have to like push yourself all the time to do these things. Like Armin had mentioned before, um, you know, you, you feel like you have this, this obligation, but then sometimes, you know, you might feel like you're, you're complaining all the time and you don't want to feel like a burden to your partner or to your kids or anything like that. Um, so it really is something that, you know, I, I think that, it's tough for a lot of guys to give yourself that grace. And I, I feel like if more guys did that, we might be in a better place when it comes to dealing with something like chronic pain. Armin? We're getting into something which is really critical here, which is the mental health aspect of it. We certainly talk about the, the physical health part and the debilitating issues of pain, but there's also so much, particularly for guys, that, I mean, the physical, ha having to admit to physical pain is one thing. Having to admit to, to psychological pain or emotional pain is a whole different issue, in it, and they're even less likely to do that. And this plays out, I mean, just taking, taking going over the, the pandemic, if you've got so much physical pain, you can't work. And if you can't work, you can't provide for your family. If you can't provide for your family, you're going to feel shame. And you're going to feel even worse. And perhaps the, the the gentleman who just wrote the thing about being the rock may be feeling some of those things, is that he's supposed to be the provider protector and he can't do those things. And this plays out in you know the, the work that I do with Men's Health Network and that Dr. Bonham does too. It, we, we see that the suicide rate for, for men is three times to four times higher than it is for women. That 70% of opiate overdoses and deaths are male. And that is a lot of having to do, having to deal with the, the psychological pain of not being able to perform the way that you'd like to perform. And so we, we need to look at, at the, so we're certainly talking about physical pain, but I don't think you can separate the two completely. Well, you know, the pressure of trying to meet expectations, fuel stress and anxiety uh, leads to depression. And we all know uh, from our various walks of life that depression just makes pain worse. So you're in this vicious cycle of stress, anxiety, depression, more pain, more stress, more anxiety, more depression. And, and you're anxious about letting others see you when you feel weak. Hiding the impact leads to feelings of isolation. I mean, John, how do you counsel people to deal with this? How do you break that cycle? It depends on what the etiology of the depression is. You know, if the etiology of the depression is physical pain, then I think that the physical pain has to be addressed. But as was uh, discussed earlier, you have to have reasonable expectations. A lot of people think that 100% uh, of the pain can be relieved. Most of the time, it can just be, just be reduced. In terms of how I tell people to, to deal with depression, um, activity is, is the opposite of depression. I had a person who was very, very depressed, an artist, and uh, I, I gave them a, a ticket to see an art show, you know, with, with animation, and it broke their depression. One thing about depression that makes it such a quagmire is that it makes you feel like you want to do nothing. And if you give into that feeling, the depression will only get worse and worse. So that for, for me, the, the, the behavioral antidote to depression is some sort of activity. Uh, if they can get moving, even, even if it's very painful to get started, they need to get moving. They need to... Uh, they need, they need to get moving, they need to not give in to the depression, and then they can often break it. Uh, they did a, a, sur a study where they looked at uh, depressed people and they divided them at random into three groups, placebo, uh, antidepressant anti medications, and exercise. The exercise group and the antidepressant medication group benefited equally. 
the placebo got slightly better because some of the people's depression resolved with time. But the basic issue is that physical activity, if they can, to as they can tolerate it, uh, is, is a good antidote to depression. If a person has joint problems and they can't exercise, I may try to get them to exercise in a pool where they, where they don't have to do weight bearing and things like that. But th those are the general ways that I that I tend to deal with it. Ramon, I know you had something to add here. Uh, sure, I happen to sit on the steering committee, executive uh, steering committee of a uh, of a uh, uh, entity that's called Movement. Movement is life. And it's built around the vicious cycle of pain and how we respond to it, uh, knee pain, if you would. And uh, the idea is that movement will help you through, just like John was just saying, uh, and any type of movement, movement in the chair, movement uh, that starts slowly with walking. I, I prescribe pool therapy quite a bit uh, to a lot of my patients, and I don't mean swimming, but just moving in the pool. And I think that that works, because if not, all the comorbidities mount up, and you get more pain, as you were saying, you get depressed, because you can't move, and uh, and then it becomes a vicious cycle. So I think that, that I think movement is key uh, to the whole thing. I've got another question from one of our viewers here. Can we address the stigma around getting help from a therapist and how to combat that as being seen as weak? And when is it time to, see th to seek therapy? So once again, I'm going to go to you first on that, Sean. I think we might have some technical issues. You know, here. in order to deal with the stigma... I basically try to use a group approach, you know, to try to get people to see that they are not alone in what they are experiencing. You know, I'm currently dealing with two people who lost their spouses very early in marriage, one age 38 and the other one in, in their 40s. I'm trying to get them together, you know, to talk about that because there's a saying, you know, uh, a joy shared is twice the joy and a sorrow shared is half a sorrow. When people feel that they're not alone, then I think that, they, that it gives them support you know, to be with other people who are in the same boat. You know, in terms of the overall stigma about mental illness, we need to, to stress the point that mental illness is, is just as much a, of a physical disease as something like diabetes. Because when you have neurotransmitters, things that are out of, out of whack in your brain, even addiction is a brain disease. So the point is that we need to talk about, okay, you know, mental illness is not doesn't mean that you're less of a human being, doesn't mean that you're crazy. It means that something is out of balance and we can get it back into balance so that you can live better. So I think that framing mental illness and, and the need for counseling in a medical model, when does a person need counseling? Uh, whenever, whenever anything is going on that is impairing their quality of life would be my answer. You know, and it could, the counseling can come from many sources where it might need even seem like counseling. Like for instance, talking to somebody in your church or something of that nature. So the point is that uh, you can deliver certain messages in a, in, a, in a more attractive package. And I think that by doing that, you can help to reduce stigma. Armin? I think we also need to do some provider training and education as well, because many of the, this is something that uh, Jean and I have worked on a couple of, uh, couple of seminars that were sponsored with Men's Health Network and PCORI uh, on mental health and, and particularly in men that many of the mental health screenings that exist today that providers use to evaluate whether somebody is uh, potentially should be referred for, for more in-depth mental health help are aimed at women. They're talking about, uh, are you crying a lot today? Do you have feelings of worthlessness? As, as a, and they're not recognizing the male specific signs of overwork or anger or isolation or substance abuse. And so a lot of guys are not being they're not being flagged the way that they should be. The, the providers are not asking them the right questions and they're not gonna get the help that they need because in many cases, again, I've already talked about the guys are not showing up and then the guys who are showing up are not necessarily being completely open and honest about their symptoms. And so they may not, they may not talk about it. If it doesn't have to do with erections or having sex, uh, a lot of guys are just not gonna talk about it. And so the providers need to be educated on the importance of screening their patients male patients in particular, 
for mental health conditions. I want to throw one other term into the mix here, um, and that's stress. You know, you talk about male specific um, indicators, uh, whereas many of the questions are, are female specific traits. Um, as somebody who suffers from psoriatic arthritis myself, I can tell you, and I'm going to go first to Pete on this one, mm -hmm. um, that when I'm in a particularly stressful period of time, my psoriatic arthritis symptoms go through the roof. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a tremendous trigger to my underlying psoriatic arthritis. Mm -hmm. Pete, did you feel the same thing with your RA? Is stress a, a trigger for worsening your symptomatology? Uh, well, actually, I'd be lying if I if I said I wasn't experiencing it right now, um, because we're actually in a new house and uh, just went through a move. And so, you know, moving a family of five and uh, everything that's associated with that. And, uh, you know, you want to make sure you get everything just right, especially like in the kids rooms and that sort of thing. And um, absolutely, you can notice, uh, especially, you know, with me with the, uh, the inflammatory arthritis, um, you know, your, your body does not, my body does not like stress. And as like a former news anchor too, you know, you, you kind of like take in the worst of everything that's happening in the world and try to, you know, compartmentalize that, not bring it home and not deal with that. So, um, you know, I can definitely attest to the fact that, that, stress and, and trying to find some way to, to combat that. Um, you know, it, I don't want to like, you know, say as far as um, like bourbon or anything like that. I know Frank Sinatra said, whatever gets you through the night. Um, but it's, I, I think that guys need to be willing to, to find something to, to kind of keep that stress level down. Because again, it can be, I think, cyclical. If you're dealing with that pain, you have the inflammation um, and it's just trying to like put a stop to like one of the other things, but stress absolutely for me has definitely affected my RA. Ramon or John have anything to add on that? Yeah. Well, no, 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 um, we, I think we need to start thinking of, of emotions as actual physical states, because when you are angry or when you are upset or when you are worried, your blood pressure, your heart rate, all of these things, are, your stress, your hormone levels of cortisol, adrenaline, things like that are completely different. The lie detector test is really an anxiety detector test. It's really an emotion because it, it picks up physiological responses to emotions. They did a study of medical students right before exams and found that their white blood count had dropped by, by a third. So the point is that when you are under emotional stress or physical stress, your entire body is different. So instead of thinking of emotions as just ghosts that have no basis in any in anything substantial, they are substantial. They are real, and they and they factor in our health. A lot of people who have not not just rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis, but a lot a, a host of physical illnesses become worse when a person is in a stressful situation. I think I think that uh, there is a the possibility of of different uh, ways to look at it. Uh, the use of uh, techniques such as uh, mindfulness has been shown to, to improve your, your, your outlook, to, to decrease stress, perhaps decrease burnout as we might see in executives or in, in physicians uh, also, uh, that feeling of being overwhelmed. And if you can uh, utilize techniques like that, uh, it would be helpful. You know, the, the term mindfulness, I do a sports medicine radio show every week and have a lot of professional athletes on my show. And the one term that comes up the most frequently on my show is mindfulness. It's amazing how athletes at all levels, um, the most successful ones, are able to channel that energy through visualization techniques and through mindfulness techniques to optimize their athletic performance. And I think it's actually a tool that we need to educate more of, of society about uh, apps like the Calm app for people to use at home to, to quell their anxieties. These are all things that I think aren't just for 
arthritic diseases. This is just going to make them feel more comfortable functioning in today's society. Rather than getting on Instagram or, you know, one of the social media things, they just need to dial up the Calm app. And I think everybody would be a lot happier. Right. You know, it's well known that Michael Jordan and uh, Kobe Bryant uh, picked up a lot of this through Phil Jackson, their coach. And he picked it up from uh, John Kabat-Zinn, who who uh, has promoted mindfulness and his uh, mindfulness stress reduction. Uh, uh, MS, uh, minor, anyway, so who has popularized that concept? And I really think that it is very helpful. Okay, we got one last segment to kind of talk a little bit about here. We're we're kind of coming into the home stretch. And this is concerning mostly work, family dynamics, and specifically fatherhood. So, Armin, I'm looking for big contributions from you here on this topic. Um, how about some tips and strategies for managing these roles, the family dynamic roles, the fatherhood roles in people who are in a chronic pain, men who are in a chronic pain situation? Armin, why don't you start us off? Well, I'd have to, to give some kudos to, to Jean for raising this issue about movement being at the heart of it. I think that the guys need to, particularly when you get a little bit older into your thirties or so, uh, you that's need to not start. Older. That's well, not older. No, I know it, it's, it's older than, it's older than 20 though. Um, but you're even, even 30 year olds get some knee problems, but you need to start doing some stretching and you need to start to doing, uh, moving around and, and getting more exercise. I mean, I, I can tell, I, I didn't have back problems until I started turning around 17 times a day to take my kids in and out of the back seat or holding a, you know, a watermelon under one arm and a kid under another one with some bag of groceries around your neck. And it, it's terrible. And we don't think about what we're doing or jumping up and, and uh, you know, playing with them in the park. I remember <laughs> just putting the kids on a, a little merry-go-round kind of thing and then jumping off of it and falling and of course you know, hurting myself. Uh, I mean, th those are the kinds of things that we need to be careful of. We need to get our kids exercising. And while they're running around, we can do some warming up and stretching. But I mean, really do take care of yourself and, and lift the way that, that your mom and dad told you how to lift by bending your knees and take good care of the back. Uh, it's it's absolutely important. And it also becomes becomes a fun thing to do with the kids because it's it, it, as childhood obesity becomes a bigger issue and childhood diabetes uh, becomes a bigger and bigger issue. We need to get our kids moving as well. And so if we can get them involved in physical activity, it's going to help them throughout their life. So kind of related to that, let me uh, throw out a question that just came across here. My pain sometimes interferes with me being able to do activities with my children. How can I explain to my children that I can't always be there for things when they need me to be without them thinking it's about them? It's their fault. Pete? What do you think? Um, well, I mean, I was going to say, I would, I was actually just waiting to hear Armin's response to that because I mean, that's something that, that I deal with as well too. You know, when, you know, our three kids are six and younger. And so when it's one of those things, you know, you don't want to seem disinterested in, in what they're doing. Um, but you also have to realize, you know, what limitations you might have. Um, so really, I mean, I, I'd be all ears for some advice, Armin. Go well, ahead, Armin. I, I was going to say, I think it's really important, particularly for younger kids, that, that they realize that we do have limitations. I mean, you're going to get all these cards about how you're the biggest and the greatest and the most wonderful dad, but it's, it's good for them. And particularly, again, young kids who are incredibly empathetic. That if you say, you know what, I just need a break. Can we do some drawing? Or how about you hop up on the bed next to me and I'll read you a story and sometimes my back hurts and sometimes I need, and then you, you would be, these are the same kids who, I think you talked about this before, Dr. Barr, you know, they, they, they may exaggerate their pain and, and having a Band-Aid all of a sudden makes it go away. Well, let them, let them help you a little bit and, and tell them you need a Band-Aid for your back. Um, get them involved in, in caring a little bit and being empathetic, but also you don't need to just say, I can't, because I can't play football with you, I can't be a dad. Well, you can draw, you can do clay, you can cook something perhaps at a counter where you can sit down. I mean, it, it's it's important to let them know that there are all alternatives and that it's okay if they have, if they feel bad too, or they're hurting, that they can take a break from what they're doing too. They don't have to keep gutting through everything. 
I think it's also important to include them in the truth about what your situation is. I think this comes up more with cancer diagnoses than, than arthritis diagnoses, but kids feel very angry when parents don't tell them the truth about what's going on and they find out later when it might be too late for them to deal with it in the way they wanted to deal with it. So I think early on involving kids, you know, we're back to shared decision-making. Mm -hmm. I think to some extent, kids, if they're age appropriate, need to be included in discussion and decision-making as well. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, you I know, know, just personally, I mean, my wife and I have done that too. And we've had the conversations with the little ones of, you know, sometimes the, the conversation begins with, so daddy, when your arthritis goes away and it's explaining <laughs> to them, what it is, um, you know, getting involved with the different events and they, they meet other people who are, um, you know, maybe experiencing something similar, even, you know, when it comes to kids who have like some sort of arthritis or some sort of pain that they're dealing with. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see that, I mean, you know, I can attest to that firsthand that especially with the young ones, they're really interested and they are like surprisingly very caring when it comes to your well-being as a parent. John, you must have some pearls of wisdom for us here. Then I'll go to Ramon. Uh, well, I don't know about pearls of wisdom. I would basically say that if you're dealing with children, uh, you know, basically, if you can't give them the thing that they want, you know, find there may be something else that they want that you can give them, you know. Like I think Armin was saying, if you can't do this, you know, you can do that. It's like a one, when one door is closed, another door is, is open. And and I think Armin made a very good point when he said, make them caregivers because they've been, they've obviously been sick at some point in time and you took care of them. You can say, well, why don't you help me out a little bit, you know, this time and, you know, make the illness part of, part of your interaction because what they're really after may not be as much a specific activity as just the process of being with you. So you may be able to offer them a, a, just a different process. Ramon? With uh, my kids are already, uh, the youngest is 47, but with the grandkids, uh, I use humor. I mean, it's obvious I can't participate like they would want me to participate, but I use humor trying to do things uh, with them. And uh, the other thing is that I believe that if you show that you're interested in what they're doing, and show support, you know, going to their games, going to showing up when you know, when they realize that you've taken time from work or you've taken time from doing your favorite activity, maybe, and uh, and going and be there for them. I'm not saying to be the obnoxious parent on the sideline, but uh, at least to 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 show them that you're you're supporting them. I think that goes a real long way. So a couple of last questions here in our last couple of minutes. Um, men sometimes define themselves by what they can do. And when that's taken away, they feel somewhat diminished. They feel less like a man. You know, you hardly ever hear women say, I feel less like a woman. Men feel less like a man. Mm -hmm. um, how do we deal with those kinds of feelings? How do we teach people or help people get through those issues when quite frankly, something physically is taken away from them with chronic pain and some of these diseases we've talked about. Um, why don't we start with you, Ramon? Well, uh, you know, when I get a patient who, who verbalizes that feeling, I, I, uh, I teach them to look at the glass half full, not half empty. You know, it's unfortunate that that you have this type of pain, uh, but it is fortunate that you have the opportunity uh, to do better. I mean, it's unfortunate you were in this uh, head-on collision. You have all these uh, uh, maladies uh, and injuries to suffer from, and you're making your way back. But it is fortunate you're here and you're alive. Uh, and you can go on uh, from there. So don't look at the negative aspect, look at the positive and go forward. Armin? A lot of it is, is 
philosophical in a way, recognizing that life changes over over the course of life and th things are going to be different. And I mean, you mentioned that it was such a poignant moment because I have written a lot about this. There's when when our kids become teenagers is one of the most difficult times for, for dads because we part of the way that we we interact and we perceive love or we we express love is by doing things for other people and we want to feel needed. And as our kids become teenagers, they start growing up, even preteens, we don't need them as they don't need us as much. And so we don't know exactly what to do. And so you have to make this transition from daddy who knows everything and is all powerful and can do everything to dad who's the coach who can who will express his opinion when it's asked for and will offer pearls of wisdom as you put them, uh, you know, when when they're most appropriate and when they're asked for. And I think that we, we need to simply acknowledge that to ourselves, that if we're going to have re good relationships with our kids in an ongoing basis, we need to change the way that we interact with them. And it's a s similar kind of thing with pain, is we need to understand that, that we have pain. I mean, I've got permanent nerve damage, and it's not going away. And I can either complain about it, or I can figure out workarounds. And my workarounds have, have to be you know, six or seven mile hikes every day. Uh, but it's we we need to understand that that life is a, is an ongoing episode and that it's going to change. John, do you have something else to add? Well, um, I think Dr. Warren Farrell said it very well about this this issue. He said that society regards women as human beings, but it regards men as human doings. Mm -hmm. You know that it's just our actions are our only worth. And I think it's important to try to get beyond that to just basically say it's not just what you do. You have in, you have intrinsic value. People care about you. And also to find things that they can't do one thing. Again, the, when one door is closed, the other is open philosophy. Find find things that they can do that make them feel like they're they're making a contribution, but but also help them to understand that regardless, they are a contribution. Pete, how about you? Um, you know, I, I, I think it's one of those things that's interesting for me because, you know, with my kids still being young, sort of figuring this out as we go along and, um, you know, especially with our oldest, she knows that a lot of the things that came out of this, um, were because we wanted to start a family. And I think that, uh, you know, having that open dialogue, I mean, she's six, um, I'm definitely going to be reading up on some of Armin's stuff before she hits 13. Um, but I, I, I just, it's interesting to see that dynamic, um, you know, when they're that young and how they react to something that's different, um, and how we react to that thing, you know, they pick up on that. And, uh, you know, I, I just try to do, you know, even though we can't do certain things, um, you know, just finding a different way to do something or uh, just sort of like figuring it out as we go along and just making sure you just take that time for yourself to accept that it's okay um, to take care of yourself. I mean, that's the biggest thing that, you know, it was difficult for me at first to do, but, um, you know, I, I, I like that, you know, you guys are saying just keep that uh, that conversation going among the people that are closest to you. It helps. So fine, kind of finally, as a, as a summation of everything we've talked about today, um, you know, we're, we're kind of supported here by the Arthritis Foundation and, mm -hmm. and arthritic diseases causing pain. But our major thread that we tried to talk about the whole afternoon and evening was pain. And, and pain is pain no matter what the cause of that pain is. So somebody who has rheumatoid arthritis experiences pain. It's not different pain than the pain who has, the patient who has terminal cancer and has pain. They're both very painful and those people deal with those pains in different ways. And the prognosis has nothing to do with the pain. The fact that one is, is probably gonna be your terminal event and one isn't, you're gonna have to live with it, doesn't really make a difference. Um, so I think that the important thing to put into perspective here is that overarching concept of pain and how you deal with it and how you don't let it rule your life and and share it with your family and involve your family and friends and everybody else 
And um, I mean, that's the thrust of what we've talked about today. Um, not rating, oh, his, he's in much worse shape than me. His pain must be worse. No, it's, it's the way you feel it. I, I mean, I'll, I'll share a personal thing. A couple of weeks ago, my wife said to me, gee, you haven't complained about your psoriatic arthritis lately. It must be feeling better. And I said, no, it's about the same, but what good does complaining about it do? I just have to go on and live my life and I choose not to burden you with complaining about it every single day. I think that's, that's the way people have to deal with their chronic conditions and their chronic pain and they have to learn to cope with their pain. Um, any last thoughts about those kinds of things from our members? Let's go first to Ramon. Well, I, I noticed that there's a, a question and somebody took a, uh, Umbridge or, or did not like the fact that I kind of minimized the pain of uh, osteoarthrosis as it, as compared to gouty arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and I did not mean to minimize the pain. I mean, pain is pain, as you were you're saying, and we have different, uh, the way we deal with pain is, is different in every person. But it is well known in, in, in medical uh, science that uh, like rheumatoid arthritis, like gouty arthritis has an additional component that leads to the destruction of the joint, which leads to pain. And, and so the pain is different in that aspect. Not, not that uh, it's not real pain when you have osteoarthritis. Armin? We get some exercise is, is something I would take away from this. When any kind of movement is going to help with, with whatever it is, whatever your limitations are, if you need to do it in a pool, if you need to do it sitting down, that's perfectly fine. I think another critical thing is make, if you don't already have a relationship with a provider of some kind, get on the ball and get that done. That's going to help everything moving forward. You'll have a, a partner throughout the whole thing. You'll have somebody who can keep you up to date on the latest studies. Also, educate yourself. Find whatever resources are out there. I mean, the Arthritis Foundation has got has got wonderful stuff. The VIM app that uh, your, your uh, colleague there uh, previewed for us at the very beginning, and this sounds like a wonderful thing. Men's Health Network has got a lot of resources on our site of uh, menshealthnetwork.org, including a study that we did fairly recently on men and fibromyalgia, which as you said, Dr. Byer is something that people thought it was just a, a women's disease, but it's not actually, um, nobody asked before. Uh, so I think all of those things, learning, educating, continuing the process and, and don't give up as uh, I think Pete said, or it, it, it just, here, you know, this is, this is the way life is. You can give up or you can not give up and your kids need you to not give up. John? Having seen elderly, having seen elderly uh, workers and also people who are injured on the job in drug treatment clinics, one of the things I would like to see for men that I haven't seen develop so far are protocols for dealing with the aging laborer and also protocols for preventing joint injury. Because I think that a lot of the things that I've seen in the workplace are probably unnecessary if people have followed certain procedures. And I think that there needs to be more awareness that men do get arthritis and, and a substantial amount of men's arthritis comes from our work roles, especially those who are involved in physical labor. Pete, I'm going to go to you for the final words and then you can give us a little riff on one of those keyboards I see. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Right. And that's, Hey, that was one adjustment I had to make too. Thankfully I, I never learned how to play properly. I just play by ear. So they just kind of like, find where they need to go. Um, yeah, I, I like the fact, I would say that, um, you know, finding those resources and knowing that, you know, pain can be isolating and, and it can feel like you're the only person in the world that nobody can have any idea what you're going through. And I think finding those resources, um, you know, getting out, getting active, uh, as, as you guys have mentioned, and, and getting to know people in these communities that are out there. The Arthritis Foundation is a great resource for that, to know that you're not alone in what you're going through. Um, you know, you don't have to like power through things or whatever. It's okay mm -hmm. to feel what you're feeling and know that you're not alone in doing that and to absolutely never give up. 
Uh, the one thing missing back there, Pete, is that Hammond B3. I don't see a B3 back there. Uh -huh. Okay, so that kind of really wraps up our time here. I really, really wanted to thank Dr. Bonham, Dr. Jimenez, um, Armin, and Pete for being here with us today. I think this has been pretty eye-opening. I think that there was a lot of information that we put out there for our viewers and listeners, and I hope it's been helpful to everybody who's tuned in. Thank you all for your participation. Thank you to all of you who uh, tuned in for the show, and uh, hopefully we can do another one of these again soon. Thanks, everybody, and be safe.